an der schönen blauen Donau von Johann. So, uh, very warm welcome to the today's first session of the GIC Open Forum on Quality Labeling of Digital Tools. My name is Andreas Klingler. I'm the current chair of the Joint Initiative Council. And as usual disclaimer, I'm employed by Siemens Health Engineers. Um, Christian, I cannot see the slides yet. No. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Next slide, um, please, Christian. So first, a few words about the Joint Initiative Council. Uh, the GIC was established in 2007 um, by a, a bunch of STOs um, to come together as the, as the GIC uh, to foster collaboration between the, the SDOs and uh, essentially supporting and, and helping the uh, digital transformation and uh, information interoperability. Um, next slide. Today, there are uh, 10 uh, GIC members. You see them all on the screen, uh, all well-known SDOs in that area. Uh, the latest addition is the, the ITU, which just joined uh, the Joint Initiative Council. And uh, we are also uh, looking forward uh, to more uh, SDOs and, and partners to join the, S uh, the Joint Initiative Council. Uh, so quite an interesting uh, group where all the relevant SDOs uh, essentially um, are in. Next slide. So what is to today about? Many thousand health and wellness apps exist nowadays. The most popular ones of these have millions of downloads in app stores. Some of these apps fall under medical device regulations, most do not. How do users, many of the people with health conditions, know which of these apps are safe, reliable, and effective? How do healthcare providers know which of these apps they can recommend to their patients? In which apps data, which is shown to them by their patients, they can trust? How do payers know which of these apps they can reimburse? Correspondingly, many countries have started to set up own certification programs for health apps. A prominent example is, uh, for example, the DIGAS in my own country, Germany. However, every country and region defining own interoperability criteria for these certification programs, of course, leads to a fragmentation of the market. The inability to benefit from economies of scale, and thus in a reduction of availability of apps which effectively address health issues for people in need. And in general, that causes just a lot of confusion and frustration. Next slide. Uh, so standards can actually help to, to avoid this in two levels. And the international standards, which sets a baseline for quality labels of apps, guides, regulators in defining certification schemes, allows to reuse certifications and establishes a global market for developers of these apps. This is actually what is 82304 that two is about, and we will hear more about it later in this open forum. Additionally, standards like the ones from the SDOs represented in the GIC help developers in creating high quality apps. In the panel today, we will hear from representatives of GIC member SDOs how their standards contribute to this goal. Individually, as well as through GIC facilitated collaboration among the SDOs. Next slide. Um, some logistics. Um, what's your role as a participant of, the, of this open forum? Um, please uh, use the Zoom Q&A fa facility, not, not the chat window, but the Q&A facility to, to uh, raise questions or just comment on what is presented. We will pick them up uh, after the panel dis discussion. Next slide. Um, yeah, to, and to cook everything off, uh, I'm delighted uh, that in this first uh, open forum session today, there will be another one in, uh, late, later today. Um, the first uh, session will be kicked off uh, by Serena uh, Batilomo from the Ministry of Health in Italy. 
and she will give an insight why this is important for the European Union. Union. Uh, thanks, Serena, for being with us. But uh, before handing over to Serena, uh, let me quickly introduce also the other speakers. Uh, one, one slide back. <laughs> uh, uh, first, uh, Pierre Angelo uh, Sotil from uh, CEN TC251 uh, will uh, explain how this uh, standard uh, 82304 dash 2 actually came about. And after that, uh, Peter Hoggedon, also from SNTC 251, uh, will give us some more details uh, about the standard. After that, uh, we move to the panel discussion, uh, landscape of digital tools, where we have representatives from H07, GS1, and RHE, um, explaining how their standards uh, contribute um, to creating uh, high quality digital tools. Um, Next slide. Yeah, uh, last word from, from me at the moment. Um, uh, today, stay up to date on, with the GIC. Uh, follow us on, on Twitter and, and LinkedIn uh, to get the latest updates. And now over to you, uh, Zuria. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andres. And, uh, First of all, I would like uh, to thank you, you all uh, for this opportunity to share with you some thoughts on quality labeling from the viewpoint of the Italian Ministry of Health. National uh, Italian Ministry of Health is the National Competent Authority for Health. And uh, as Andrea said, uh, we are participating to the health network uh, that is a voluntary network uh, between uh, EU, EU member states on digital health uh, in order to define the guidelines and uh, try to apply a common approach uh, for uh, cross-border uh, health data and uh, assistance. And um, during pandemic, we work uh, a lot together and uh, um, surely this network uh, implemented and used a lot of standards uh, in order to face uh, the pandemic. And uh, this is was really a success uh, um, for all of us. Okay, before answering uh, the question, why is uh, quality labeling on digital health tools uh, important? important for the European Union, I would like to uh, uh, wonder with you, uh, who is it important for? Who are the digital health tool actors? So next slide. We have four different types of actors. From user side, we have patients, but we have also health professionals. And uh, in Italy, for example, it's very important uh, to reflect uh, who are our health professionals, their age, their age. On the other side, we have manufacturers and authorities uh, to adopt also guidelines and to apply these uh, guidelines. Okay, next slide. But to understand users' characteristics, uh, if uh, we travel around Europe, uh, we could visit the beautiful places. I would like to bring you uh, all over Europe, uh, in Rome, Paris, uh, Athens. But next slide, we we have to looking at the European uh, population, and uh, we realize uh, that. Uh, uh, giving uh, their average age, uh, which is rising, uh, they do not have an high level of digital skills. Uh, in Italy, Germany, and Finland, uh, more than 22% of the population is over 65 years old. So, next slide. Uh, if we consider the uh, Digital Economy and Society Index, uh, DAISY, uh, that uh, measures uh, human capital, connectivity, integrations of digital technology and digital public services, we see that uh, between the EU member states, there is a, a variable, but uh, we didn't reach an high level. And uh, a, on average, uh, we have a score of 52.3 percentage. That means uh, that we are only halfway. So next slide. In general, uh, population uh, faces a digital divide, culturally speaking. So the first reason why quality labeling is important is to build the user's trust in digital 
health tools. And quality labeling can guarantee to patients and health professionals that with the use of digital tools in healthcare, they are not losing the quality that they already have in the face-to-face -face services. Indeed, ensuring an improvement in the timeliness, accuracy, accessibility, and quality of services, also from the point of view of data protection and security in general. This is really an important point because if you want quality of the data, we need to have, first of all, users that are using the, um, um, uh, the digital tools. And uh, I stress again, the point is not only patient, but first of all, is as professionals. Okay, the second reason is to drive the market. This is another important point. Uh, looking at, uh, next slide. Looking at the third categories uh, of users, uh, uh, the producer of digital tools, uh, quality labeling represents the possibility of knowing in advance the criteria they must comply with, so that these criteria can drive the market towards what are the fundamental characteristics that the solution must re respect both from technological and clinical organizational viewpoints. And uh, if we consider <laughs> European Union, we have uh, uh, many regulation, uh, European data protection regulation, which requires uh, uh, to design uh, digital tools uh, with a privacy by design and privacy by default. Nevertheless, we need to ensure that uh, interoperability standards will also be guaranteed since nowadays it's no longer possible to think of digital solutions that are not able to dialogue with the others. Next slide. During the pandemic, the Yelp network has defined uh, technical specification for contact tracing mobile apps. And in the Annex 4 uh, of, the, um, uh, of this specification, uh, the uh, standard uh, SAN ISO uh, 82 2 uh, is mentioned. It, it was uh, under development during that period, uh, but it was already mentioned. This uh, means uh, that for the health network, uh, for all the authorities uh, that uh, need to regulate uh, the share or uh, the use uh, of a health solution and health data, um, uh, all the all the the work that you are leading and you are doing is is really very very important because we are still uh, users of your job um Next slide. Also, the European Coordination Committee on the Radiological, Electromedical, and Healthcare IT Industry, so from the manufacturing point of view, mentioned this standard and the voluntary labeling system for health apps based on four dimensions, healthy and safe, easy to use, secure data, and robust build. Um, next slide. Another uh, practical example of the importance of a quality labeling uh, from that can drive the market, uh, we have it in Italy. We are working in Italy for the use of telemedicine for enhancing home care. So we are planning to publish a national catalog of uh, telehealth and telemedicine solutions compliant with national and international standards. So we are defining an onboarding process uh, for validation with uh, 137 criteria that should be respected by the telehealth solution to be inserted uh, in this uh, national catalog. Such quality criteria builds on existing European standards, and one of the main inspires has been uh, uh, SEN ISO TS 82304. Um, uh, the quality label sign at the end of the assessment is meant to be easily understood by the users and all stakeholders. 
to build that trust that I uh, explained as the first reason. Because uh, if I don't know, uh, I, I have a digital divide, but I know that uh, some author uh, authority uh, labeling and guarantee to me that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, really uh, a good tool, surely I'm more, much more confident in using of it. Next slide. We can arrive to the third reason, to ensure interoperability of system and health data. Next. Uh, the pandemic has demonstrated that the European Union can be resilient with uh, um, trusted quality digital tools rapidly made available to the population. But it's also highlighted that the proper ammunition is needed uh, so that digital products in general and telehealth systems in particular can be rapidly deployed by the authorities in order to ample usage of remote prevention assistance and monitoring and for the implementation of standards to support the process. In short, there is a need for true digitalization, but not just for emergency situation. We have to implement it structurally for a day-by-day -day assistant. So there is another important goal in Europe. Next, next slide, please. In uh, for the 2030 uh, digital compass, uh, we have an ambitious aim uh, that all EU citizens have access to their medical records online. And uh, so uh, to do this, uh, uh, we have to implement standards uh, to ensure interoperability of the data. To reach this uh, European goal, uh, we are working on a very challenging project to create also a European health data space to use it both for primary use, prevention, diagnosis, healthcare, and secondary use, ensure a consistent framework for the use of individual health data for research, innovation, policy making, and regulatory activities. Mm. It will not be easy to, to build this European health data space, it will be a federated system, but what is very, very important is to uh, set up a definition of common rules and standards to ensure uh, to have this common uh, space and the share of the data. Um, uh, next. So, um, the, so we, we are setting up rules for electronic health record systems uh, uh, and also rules and mechanism supporting the secondary use of health electronic data and also um, a, a building a cross-border infrastructure for uh, the use for primary and secondary use of health data. Next. So EU standardization and quality goals are a declared need to strengthen European leadership in global standards, uh, making European input a valuable contribution to the global standardization, the standardization process, identify and harmonize requirements and needs originating in the national member states, because also uh, to share and to discuss and to see from different viewpoints is really important because all these standards has to satisfy the um, uh, single, single needs of the uh, single member states. Facilitating the adoption of interoperable quality solution relevant to national member states. In conclusion, in uh, such scenario, uh, is, it's essential to have a definition of standard uh, uh, ontologies uh, coding. Uh, this is, I think, it's uh, surely a prerequisite. Uh, it's a starting point, and uh, as I said before, I would like to thank all of you that are working uh, for this aim. Nevertheless, uh, next slide. This point of definition is not sufficient because we need to see these standards implemented into the practical real life, daily life. So 
quality labeling and quality criteria for digital health tools represent a bridge between the definition of standards and their implementation in the real life, uh, supporting and connecting uh, the regulatory implementation and use of digital tools. And this is from all the four points of view that I've seen, we have seen at the beginning, the four different actors, authorities, uh, producers, uh, healthcare professional, and citizen. So thank, uh, thanks to all of you. I hope these thoughts could be useful uh, for the discussion and for the share of this uh, meeting. And uh, I'll continue listening to you. Bye. Thanks a lot, Serena, for this interesting insight on why this is important for Italy, but also the European Union and in, in general. I'd like now to hand over uh, to Pier Angelo uh, to give us some insight um, uh, yeah, how actually 82304-2 uh, came about. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for participating and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, make this presentation and uh, uh, especially after the great introduction from uh, from Serena Batilomo. Uh, next slide, we will talk about how uh, the process of identifying a quality uh, framework for evaluating and validating uh, digital tools and applying a quality label actually started. And we will also try to give some insight on, on where uh, we are going to. Uh, this uh, first slide uh, wants to uh, gather uh, where it started. In short, I will go through uh, the list of things in just a moment, but in short, uh, when we talk about digital tools, we are always talking about interoperability, security, uh, medical device regulations, and a, a whole bunch of things, which uh, the assessment of health risks and so on. Uh, this bunch of things has always been uh, separated. I mean, there's uh, we need interoperability on one side. We need uh, the assessment of health risk or digital tools, but it's somewhere else. Uh, so, so the basic idea uh, and need was to put them together in a quality criteria framework. And this process actually started uh, or, uh, or became explicit back in 2014 when the European Commission published a green paper on uh, mobile health, uh, addressing possible benefits and risks of health apps. Uh, there was questions on how uh, we could uh, ensure the efficacy of uh, health apps and so on with certification scheme and how to inform the users. Uh, more or less just after that, or at the same time, there were different initiatives in Europe which were going on uh, related to the quality and the characteristics of health apps, health and wellness apps. Uh, notable, the most notable is the uh, publicly accessible specification uh, in UK, uh, which actually released a very important document on health and wellness apps, uh, the quality criteria. But also in other countries, a lot of things were going on. For example, in Italy, uh, we were working on a criteria to identify apps um, uh, to uh, sort of uh, uh, enforce the need for more information when uh, health or wellness apps were being released on the market. Uh, already in 2017, the rolling plan for ICT standardization released by the European Com uh, Commission mentioned uh, the United Kingdom uh, specification and the need to take this further. Uh, and in 2018, uh, the digital uh, transformation of health and care communication was actually published, also mentioning this. Next slide, please. In fact, uh, the digital transformation recommended that we use digital services for citizen empowerment and as certain centered care. And there were some uh, common principles and certification criteria to facilitate the supply and deployment of these tools. Uh, especially and uh, by medium and uh, small uh, enterprises. Next slide, please. Uh, at this point, after all of these, uh, let's say, propedeutic um, 
uh, initiatives, um, the European Commission actually uh, allowed funding for a SEN uh, technical specification project uh, to work on the quality and reliability of health and wellness apps. Uh, it uh, encompassed and included all of the previous uh, uh, initiatives that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, since uh, the need for quality labeling and quality criteria is, uh, is a European priority, but is actually a, a global, uh, global need, immediately ISO TC251215 uh, started and um, IEC came along through the Joint Working Group 7 with uh, ISO TC215 uh, regarding safe, effective and secure health uh, software. The project to deliver the, the technical specification was carried out within uh, ISO with a uh, send lead under the Vienna Agreement. Uh, in this uh, project, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, uh, which is a global uh, initiative at this point in time, there was a direct involvement also of HL7, considering the work as part of the uh, CMF, uh, which by the way will also be uh, highlighted during this open forum. Next slide, please. Well, uh, I will not go into the detail of the technical specification itself because that's a matter of uh, the speech from uh, Petra Hugendorn, which will come uh, after me. Uh, uh, we just want to mention that during this, uh, the work to release the technical specification, um, over 25 existing same frameworks uh, on uh, health and wellness apps were actually studied. And the work was compared to 20 that were included in a previous uh, WHA study. Uh, we went, uh, the, the, the team working on the uh, project on the technical specification went further to that. We also, uh, we tried to cover uh, all the domains, including a new one, ethics. And we involved many stakeholders. Uh, um, we, we assessed a lot of frameworks. And um, we referenced uh, as many and looked at as many uh, standard organization uh, possible to actually come out with an encompassing and uh, 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 relevant technical specification. Next slide, please. Uh, Serena Batilom already mentioned that uh, uh, the, this uh, technical specification, even if it was in a draft state and we we're working on it, uh, was immediately recognized as very important uh, to validate uh, health apps that were used during the pandemic. Uh, but also, even while it was still uh, in draft state, it was used uh, throughout Europe. Uh, of course, I give an exa Italian example. Uh, it was used uh, even if in a draft state during uh, Italian tenders, uh, national, national, uh, nationwide, for the clinical assistance, healthcare information system for the public administration. Also there, it was recognized that there was a need for quality criteria. Next slide, please. The technical specification was uh, published in uh, uh, July 2021, and it provides, as I stated, quality requirements for health apps and defines a health app quality label so that uh, the user and the decision makers and all stakeholders can actually visualize the quality and reliability of health apps. And it is uh, the second part uh, of a series which applies to safety and security of health software products. Next slide, please. Now, having stated how it all started and where we uh, are at the moment and the importance of uh, quality labeling, uh, bringing together all of these requirements uh, for health digital tools into one framework, let's take a look at how things are, are moving forward. Next slide, please. Now, as as already stated, uh, but it's uh, it's good to review this. Um, we are pushing uh, at all levels uh, very much how um, how it is important that the manufacturer know and advance the criteria they must comply with, that decision makers have the commonly agreed tools. Um, 
and ammunition uh, to identify which digital tools are of high quality. Uh, there's an example which uh, we usually talk about during the pandemic, uh, doctors required to recommend, if not prescribe, um, um, the, the devices for measuring the saturation, the oxygen in the blood. And of course, uh, there were many of these, uh, many of them were actually uh, certified as medical devices, but uh, they had different costs and they had different quality, but there uh, was very little uh, ammunition for the prescribers to actually recognize which products were of high quality, even if they had the same level of classification. And this is where we are trying to provide the solution, quality criteria, uh, so that also not only the decision makers, but also the computer consumers are able to recognize the quality of the systems at the time of purchase. Next slide, please. So uh, where are we going at the moment? We're going uh, to, um, uh, there's a lot of use of the standard in Netherlands, Italy, Norway, Catalonia. Uh, there are EU projects, uh, which uh, the first one labeled to enable will be presented by uh, Petra Hugendorn after me. Uh, there's another project, Expand the H. Uh, the HD, EHDS, and COSIA were already mentioned in the previous presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the European Health Data Space uh, uh, was already presented by Serena Battilomo. What I would like to add that inside the draft regulation, which is still being uh, um, drafted and uh, worked upon within the European Commission, it also mentions quality labeling and voluntary labeling for wellness application because it is recognized at all levels the need for quality labeling. And quality labeling, of course, requires quality criteria which encompasses uh, very many requirements and comes from commonly agreed EU and global standards. Next slide, please. Uh, while Label to Enable will be presented shortly, I just wanted to present another European project which has the goal of expanding the use of the European Electronic Health Record Exchange format uh, throughout uh, the European ecosystem, uh, which uh, the goal of which is to converge on common usable and re reliable tools for interoperable services uh, for the cooperation. Well, a lot of this new project that will actually start in 2023 uh, regards also uh, technical requirements for quality labeling of consumer health products. With this, uh, I mean to say that, uh, yes, we started with uh, health and wellness apps, but the need for quality labeling is much wider and can actually encompass a lot of digital tools, and we will be talking about this later in the, the panel with four colleagues. Um, next slide, which is just a thank you uh, for the organizers and for uh, the audience. Um, I leave the floor to uh, Andreas. Thank Andreas. you very much. Thanks a lot, Pian Angelo, for this uh, very interesting insight on uh, yeah how actually multiple SDOs work together uh, to uh, eventually uh, create this new standard and also uh, setting it in context and uh, giving an outlook where this might go. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, uh, um, please post uh, questions in, in the Q&A uh, so we can answer them uh, after, after the panel. Um, with this, I hand over uh, to, to Peter. Uh, which will give a little bit more insight on what is actually mentioned in 82.304-2. Uh, Over to you, Peter. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, um, uh, this morning me and this afternoon uh, Charlie McKay uh, to tell a bit more about uh, 82.304 part two. And now I lose part of my vision. Um, so what is uh, uh, A2304 part two? Well, the short answer is it's, it's the energy label, uh, EU energy label, but then for health apps with, uh, uh, as you can see, a similar score. Uh, yeah, if you could click, um, that uh, also translates into uh, a label 
Um, and the score you see on the left uh, relates to the, if you click, uh, relates to the score at the bottom of the label. So in different details, more on the quality of health apps. And as you can see already translated in different um, uh, languages. Next slide. So it works similar to the EU energy score. If you can click, uh, you can see that there's uh, um, yeah, the score. And then if you click on it, uh, you get the label, and if you click then on the QR code, you actually get into the April uh, Click New Database uh, with even more detail, and we have a similar uh, setup. Next slide. Now, this is what you get when you look into the App Store and how to distinguish a good health app here. Research has shown so far that uh, neither the ranking uh, nor the user reviews uh, nor the descriptions tell uh, really tell about what quality is. Next slide. Uh, and patients and carers uh, have uh, uh, told before that it's really difficult to choose uh, a good app. Uh, there are so many of them, over 300,000 or 350,000. People don't know uh, which one to choose. Uh, they're not sure health apps will help them. They know of no health apps relevant to them, and they're suspicious because they don't know who makes them. Next slide. Um, healthcare professionals have a similar uh, issues. They too lack uh, knowledge of effective apps and uh, a trustworthy source to access apps. And this was an Australian study, but similar ones uh, are available for uh, Europe. Next slide. Um, for manufacturers, it's quite difficult too. They struggle with uh, several different frameworks. Uh, click uh, and uh, selling them uh, as well as a difficulty too. Uh, in Germany now, 33 apps are reimbursed. Uh, five were reimbursed, but are no longer reimbursed. Um, and Germany is front runner in Europe, as mentioned before. Belgium uh, is considered the number two. Uh, they launched uh, uh, the M Health Belgium uh, validation pyramid some four years ago, and they have now one app reimbursed. And you can see which one after the click, move up. Next slide. Uh, for authorities, it's difficult too. Uh, this was a study done in Nature where they compared nine different uh, health app policies in nine countries, seven out of them in Europe. Um, and they told that even the ones that are considered advanced, uh, so again, Belgium, Germany, the UK, um, uh, they struggle with uh, the efficiency of their process. Uh, and they conclude that cross-national efforts are needed around regulation and for countries to realize the benefits of health apps. Next slide. So the long answer to what is A2304 part two, um, A2304 part two is comprehensive. Uh, so it includes both wellness and medical device apps, but we're not duplicating the work of notified bodies. So as of class 2A, notified bodies will assess an app uh, and we're looking at uh, what, what Part of our uh, questions are they already covering and we're not duplicating their work, but we hope to get the information in the label and in the um, report. Uh, evidence informed, so the EU energy label uh, is very, very effective, used by 85% of uh, EU consumers and in 59 non-EU countries. Uh, inclusive, we tested the label with people with low health literacy uh, already in the Netherlands and in the project we're uh, they're doing for more countries, Denmark, Hungary, Italy, and likely France. Um, so informative, there's a score label and report which communicate the quality in a glance uh, to the needed detail that doctors need to recommend an app. Uh, proportionate, there are at most 81 questions uh, in the health app assessment framework. Uh, 67 of them are score impacting yes, no questions. And if uh, manufacturers answer yes, they need to supply evidence which will then be assessed by uh, accredited app assessors. Um, why these 81 questions? Well, the assessment framework was founded in a Delphi study with 83 experts uh, from eight stakeholder groups and uh, six um, parts of the world. <laughs> uh, no, uh, global uh, uh, experts, but mostly European, I have to uh, mention. And it's maintained by Sense and LEC and ISO and IEC, which are, by the way, also connected to the EU energy label. Next slide. 
So who can benefit? As you can see on this slide, uh, a lot of different stakeholders, and we try to include them in the label to enable uh, project, which is to uh, help implement A2304 part two. Uh, next slide. As you can see, they are uh, represented already in the consortium, but also in a lot of the uh, subcontractors and other uh, parties we work with. Next slide. And as you can see in this overview, they all matter to uh, work towards an innovative, sustainable and globally competitive health industry, um, which is to work towards a sustainable, resilient health and wellness ecosystem. And so we're trying to help manufacturers build and improve the quality of apps. App checkers are needed to certify apps. Uh, we'd like to have healthcare systems and authorities to adopt the label and reimburse apps, some of them at least. Um, uh, we need app stores, app libraries, and trusted sources uh, to store and publish the label. Uh, we need healthcare professionals to use the label and recommend apps and um, patient citizens and carers to use the label and consider to use apps. So we're working, as you can see, in different work packages on all these different stakeholders. Next slide. Um, and aside from the overall objective for the uh, ecosystem, these are further project objectives for the individual uh, stakeholders involved and literally the project objectives we got from the commission. Next slide. Uh, the project, Label to Enable project, consists of three pillars, trust, use, and adoption. Uh, main deliverable for trust is the uh, trusted SEN ISO TSA 2304 Part 2 uh, ISO 17000 certification scheme, uh, which will test with 24 app manufacturers and uh, five or six uh, app assessment organizations for consistency, so inter-rater uh, reliability. Each app gets tested by two different app uh, assessors, and then we compare if they come up with the same results. Uh, fine-tuning uh, along the way, uh, but we're also looking for efficiency and clarity. Is it self-explanatory to both the manufacturers and the app assessors? We're aligning with EU legislation, EU values, uh, and stakeholder trust, uh, looking into business models and label legislation as well. Uh, the pillar use is about uh, the uh, mainly the the patients and the healthcare, healthcare professionals. We're creating the communication they need. Uh, we're testing the label, uh, as I mentioned, in four corners of Europe, uh, creating with that the communication to introduce the label well to patients, citizens, and carers. And together with the healthcare professionals, we're uh, detailing um, the health app quality report. What do they need uh, uh, to be able to recommend an app? We're also testing the display of the label in app stores, app libraries, and trusted sources. And finally, the adoption uh, pillar is about co-creating a single market, a digital single market, which means cross-country recognition of the EU certification scheme mentioned. Um, we're involving relevant stakeholders through various channels, uh, separately, but also jointly. Um, we're documenting use stories of pilots uh, that are already existing uh, in Italy, Catalonia, or, or that are on the verge of existing and already existing in uh, Italy, Catalonia, the Netherlands and Norway. And we're exploring with health insurers and health technology assessment bodies um, how the framework might uh, help in their decision making, speeding it up on reimbursement of health apps. Next slide. So early adopters, this is uh, an initiative from uh, Norway. Um, where they tested five uh, different health apps, uh, published two on their uh, national uh, uh, framework. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's one of the use stories already uh, out there. Uh, in the Netherlands, a, uh, a national assessment framework wa was already proposed to parliament uh, based on SENISO 8304 part two. Um, Italy and Catalonia are part of our uh, project. Uh, we've been told that Sweden is already uh, using it. 
um, we're trying to find out where. Uh, France has uh, mentioned uh, uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a document for the Ministry of Health that they see the potential of using the uh, standard for um, harmonization uh, in Europe. So uh, just some ideas of the early adopters. When with Finland, we're actively comparing their framework uh, with A2304 part two. Next slide. Already mentioned, uh, the European Health Data Space, they have an article on voluntary labeling of wellness applications. Uh, from what we've been told or what has been leaked, voluntary has already been removed, but let's see uh, what happens. Uh, if you click, you can see a bit more about what is mentioned there, and there's a two and a free two. Uh, so the EHDS is mainly focused on um, uh, interoperability. Um, we're not the only ones advocating for uh, expanding that to quality. Uh, as you can see, uh, it uh, now mentions wellness apps and there are other uh, parties such as the, uh, the Standing Committee of European Doctors who are already advocating for, let's focus on health applications. Uh, and so are we, and of course, we're trying to get uh, A to three or four part two uh, recognized. Um, so we're, uh, launching uh, uh, yeah, an official reaction uh, likely later this month. And there's a number three. Yeah. And the idea is, it, it is already mentioned in the HDS, uh, wellness applications cascading into, me into medical devices. Um, next slide. So uh, yeah, we hope to stay in touch and this is uh, how you can uh, reach us. And of course we hope to align further where we can. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Peter, for giving an insight what actually is in 82, um, three or four dash two. And also um, uh, showing that uh, some early adoption has started already. Also, thank you for the other presenters so far for setting the stage for the panel which is about to start now. And for this, I hand over to Robert and, and Pierre Angelo to moderate it. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, hello once again, uh, everybody. <clears throat> we will now have <clears throat> four uh, talks about the standards and standardization in the landscape of quality and digital uh, tools. Uh, the goal of this session is to uh, talk about other uh, initiatives uh, currently in uh, progress regarding quality uh, labeling of digital tools and so on. Uh, but also in the panel that will follow, we will talk about uh, how um, uh, things will go in the future with respect to the collaboration of the different standardization bodies and and where uh, it is expected that we will extend quality labeling uh, also well beyond uh, um, health apps and wellness apps extending possibly the existing standard. Uh, the first uh, that I will leave the floor to is Frank Plegg from uh, HL7. And um, well, Frank, uh, please continue from here. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre Angelo, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to tell you something about the HL7 Consumer Mobile Health Application Framework, which I will further on uh, refer to as CMAF. Next slide, please. Um, my name is uh, Frank Ploeg. I'm an enterprise architect at the University Medical Center in uh, Groningen, the Netherlands, and I've been part of the HL7 family of over 30 years, and I'm heavily involved in the development of CMAF. Next, please. Uh, CMAF was a standard that was uh, derived with uh, uh, as part of the comprehensive HL7 uh, framework um, and it was to uh, provide a common uh, foundation for mobile health apps with uh, addressing uh, categories like uh, mentioned here product information security it's about the life cycle of a health app from start to finish from cradle to grave next please uh, we were especially concerned uh, with, as a target audience, with the mobile health app developers. Uh, what is their uh, criteria, how to develop an app, and what should and should not be addressed. And of course, beneficiaries are also consumers, providers, and caregivers. 
and especially the consumers need protection and transparency on how the app was built and how it was um, created. Next, please. Um, CMAF and ISO TS82342 have been working together very, very um, closely. I've been part of the TS82342 uh, project team. And there's been a lot of uh, alignment and uh, uh, synchronization between the two standards, although they have a different approach. <clears throat> CMAF is uh, part, as I said before, of the uh, HL7 framework and is uh, derived from the HL7 uh, electronic health record system functional model. And it's based on that, um, uh, um, the way it was uh, it created and it can be, uh, CMAF can be constrained or extended to focus on special realms and it can be used within other HL7 standards very easily. It's built on the shall, shoot, may and uh, the if variants of, uh, of requirements. I will um, address that in a minute. Uh, next please. The domains CMAF addresses are the uh, functional and non-functional requirements and as I mentioned before they address the whole life cycle of the um, of the app to start and finish and uh, <clears throat> some non-functions non i'm not going to read them all out but uh, they're all all the parts that you need to know about when you um, implement uh, an app uh, next please uh, we're currently in the st we currently finished the stu2 ballot so we're moving on forwards to normative and <clears throat> we're uh, very closely working to migrate the uh, the contents of the standard which will not change but the format will change into the uh, uh, truly ehr uh, sfm format next please uh, these are the central use cases that cmf addresses uh, they go from very <clears throat> simple use cases of the use of a health app to a smartphone to actually the use of health apps within the uh, uh, EHR uh, environment. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> this is the way CMAP is built. Uh, it's called. It's built by requirements, according to the uh, functional model that we use within uh, HL7, and <clears throat> they have a strength varying from shall to should to may and the if variance if something is, is applicable or not. And based on this uh, uh, this uh, strength, we try to uh, build a score. Next, please. To disclose, uh, to give you the evidence in the label, this is what our initial label was before uh, I joined TS82304-2. Um, I think we need to go to one label. It was going to be my last slide, but this is what, how we uh, previously uh, perceived how a label could look like. Next, please. We also tried to develop a scoring mechanism. Uh, so uh, it's been mentioned before by Petra and, and others that that is easy for the users to identify an app that they uh, can use. So I will not go into that too, in detail. Next, please. I've got three seconds left. Um, <clears throat> we're going to wait uh, per domain, and that's why we uh, set up uh, some sort of uh, uh, scoring per, uh, for conformance levels uh, next please and that could uh, look something like this if you fully meet criteria you get a lot of points if you don't meet criteria uh, you get no points uh, whatsoever next please i will quickly go through the next ones because others have already mentioned this is about how we act actually need some sort of, of scoring mechanism so please go to the next one and then to the next one. Uh, this has all been mentioned before. Next, please. Um, and then the last slide. Uh, I think uh, as, as as we have been working as CMF with the HL7 uh, with the TS uh, 823024-2. Um, I think we'll continue to do that, and I think uh, this world is. Uh, very much help with one label rather than more labels. So we will try to migrate our label to the uh, TS uh, label. Uh, one minute and 15 seconds beyond my time. Thank you very much for your, for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for the insight on CMAF. Uh, just to say again, uh, Frank has said it, and uh, we already said it uh, previously, uh, HL7 and CMAF uh, uh, have worked uh, with uh, SEN, ISO, and IEC in the uh, delivery, the editing, and the preparation of uh, of uh, the technical specification on the quality and reliability of apps. And we are continuing the uh, collaboration with HL7, but also with the other SDOs uh, within the, the JIC to actually bring everything uh, further. Uh, I will now leave the floor to Phil Archer of uh, GS1, uh, who will talk about uh, patient instructions, uh, barcodes, and all of uh, <laughs> a lot of interesting things from GS1. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Peter Angelo. Who'd have thought somebody from GS1 talking about barcodes? Um, it's what we do. Uh, for those of you who don't know GS1, we're often known as the barcode people. And if you look at many pharmaceutical products and medical devices around the world, next slide, you will see a two-dimensional barcode that looks like this. And it contains four pieces of information. There's what we call the global trade um, item number. That's the thing that if you go to the supermarket, that's the thing that goes beep, uh, as well as a batch number and expiry date in a serial. And sometimes there are other national things there as well. So there's a bunch of information that is encoded on billions of devices. And the kind of apps we're talking about today may want to make use of that information in their information systems. There's a problem. Uh, next slide. If we show you that information as a string of characters that gets encoded in the barcode, it looks like that. And most people have no idea what that means. In fact, it gets worse. Next slide. What actually gets encoded is that there are no brackets. There aren't any color coding. You just sort of have, kind of have to know. Now, the world of scanners and printers do understand this. It's an extremely efficient, very carefully defined, well-established mechanism for putting identifiers onto a thing. And this particular kind of barcode is particularly um, uh, encouraged and strongly endorsed by the GS1 community for use in healthcare. But have a look at this. This is the same information. This is that trade item number, that batch number, the serial the expiry date encoded in a much more familiar structure. And although, yes, it's a URL, um, the domain name doesn't matter. Hmm. In other words, those identifiers are there. That thing is identified irrespective of the domain name, which means that your app can extract that information. But if you haven't got an app, what else happens? Click next slide. What we can do is by default, an app can look at that GS1 data matrix, as we call it, with those bits of information. It can turn that weird looking string that nobody else understands into a URL and pass it on to a system. And the system says, oh, you haven't asked for anything special. I'm going to give you the default response, which in the healthcare world is likely to be something like um, an information leaflet for patients. But the app could also say, no, actually, I'm a clinician. I want the clinical information. I'm a pharmacologist. I want the pharmacological information. I want um, a video that helps me show a child how to use this. You can ask the system, based on that GS1 identifier and that standardized way of writing those identifiers into a URL into, uh, to, to ask it for specific things. It means that every pharmaceutical, every medical device has a basic API. We can do better than that too, click. Because of that standardized um, structure in the URL, it's easy to actually link these different data services together. We, GS1, have no interest in running these data services. That's up to the individual manufacturers and clinicians, not our job. What we can do is to link a physical thing to the right information. We operate a service. Uh, you don't have to use it. If you want to, it's free, it's performant, it's resilient, and we will happily redirect the query um, this is under the instruction of the brand owner, I should say, not our instruction. We don't decide this. The manufacturer would decide this. We can redirect to, to uh, whichever source of information they want. And these things form um, an ecosystem of different data sources. And the kind of apps we're talking about today could be enhanced, added to. Another thing you could add to is, does it recognize the GS1 system to get to manufacturer authorized information? The final thing that we're doing, next slide, to try and make that easy 
is we're providing um, little bits of um, software libraries that are designed to be added easily into those apps. We've got one for Android, one for iOS. This is under development. We expect it to be, be available properly around about um, the turn of the year, maybe January, something like that. Um, the earlier versions are all working. We can do this translation from what's in that GS1 two-dimensional barcode into the URI, and we can send it off to wherever the manufacturer tells us to. So what we're trying to do, just for clarity, is take that barcode that is already on billions of pharmaceuticals and medical devices and give quality medical apps a means to access the information that goes with that without having to put some proprietary app-based identifier on the pack as well. You can use the one that's there already. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, for uh, giving this insight on uh, on GS1 and sticking also to the time. Uh, before passing uh, the floor to uh, the next lecture, I would like to remind the attendees of this open forum that it is possible to uh, uh, put questions to uh, the panel and actually all of the uh, presenters uh, by using the question and answers uh, tool button that you find at the bottom of the um, uh, screen. Uh, we will be happy to try to respond to all questions uh, within uh, within this session. Okay, having said this, I will now leave the floor to Derek Ritz of IAG uh, to talk about a bit about conformance testing and uh, where, where that fits in. Thank you very much, Derek. Thanks, Pierangelo. Um, my name is Derek Ritz. I'm a member of IHE Can Canada's community. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to do today is focusing on a specific area of digital health labeling and regulation, and that is software as a medical device. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our agenda for today, but our time is short, so I'm actually just going to move it right along. We're going to try to do five points in five minutes. Let's begin. Uh, at a top level, base standards are developed by standards development organizations. Collections of these base standards are referenced by implementable, testable interoperability specifications like IHE profiles. As an instrument of governance, vendors' solutions demonstrate adherence to these specs at conformance testing events. Care delivery network operators, such as ministries of health, leverage conformant solutions to support digitally enabled healthcare for their populations. IHE's value proposition lies in the middle two areas. So what role does IHE play in the standards SDO ecosystem? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, IHE plays this role through its domain and deployment committees. Domain committees are supported by clinical bodies and uh, their job is to create engineering artifacts. Deployment committees represent uh, national uh, scopes of practice and national, they nationalize the artifacts, they do conformance testing and they exert governance. Next slide, please. So what is software as a medical device? Next slide. I know that it's a tautology, but software that meets the definition of a medical device can be regulated as such. Uh, this isn't intended, it's a busy slide, I apologize for that, and it's not intended to be an eye chart. But as an example, uh, can in Canada, uh, a software that is informing the course of care for predicting risk of diabetes would meet the definition of a class two medical device. Next slide, please. Uh, the Canadian regulations follow generally uh, the agreed patterns from the IMDRF, the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. So the way that, that software is regulated in medical as a medical device in Canada is consistent with how it's done internationally. Next slide, please. Well, how do we regulate software as a medical device? Next slide. Uh, in Canada and elsewhere, the way that it's done today is it's got a pre-market focused and a risk-based approach. Next slide, please. 
Again, this isn't intended to be an eye chart, but uh, a manufacturer of software as a medical device has to have a quality management system, a QMS, that's adherent to ISO 1345. And 1345 is uh, a flavor of the ISO 9000 family of standards specifically focused on medical devices. Uh, there could be, uh, it could leverage ISO 62304, which is the predecessor to the 82304 family. Uh, to which, and focuses specifically on how you manufacture software as medical devices. Uh, and it could leverage risk assessments based on 14971. Uh, this particular QMS diagram uh, is from a company that went through a successful medical device regulation uh, certification uh, last year. Next slide, please. How do we plan to regulate AI software as a medical device and other new digital health innovations? Next slide. Uh, there's an inconvenient truth for us all. From emergent properties come emergent risks, and the things we like so much about AI uh, also create challenges for how we regulate it. Next slide. Canada plans to use a regulatory sandbox approach. We're going to be learning as we go, but it, the key thing here is that it creates post-market obligations for the manufacturer that ensures appropriate oversight to mitigate risks. The first uh, of the two examples is going to be uh, ML-based AI. Uh, sorry, ML-based software's medical device. Uh, there has been some important work done jointly by the ITU and the WHO uh, regarding the development of a benchmarking approach, and that can potentially be leveraged for both the pre-market certification and the post-market monitoring. Next slide, please. All right, what role does IHE expect to play? Next slide. Uh, in September of this year, IHG published its new strategic plan. Pillar three of that plan is to focus on evidence-based care and how we're going to enable that to be adopted at scale. Uh, there's a short uh, a set of five tactics that are referenced here. Um, First of all, IHE is going to be developing and publishing profiles that focus in this area, such as the computable care guidelines or radiology AI results profiles. Secondly, we'll be engaging with organizations that publish care guidelines now and assist them in publishing computable versions of these. Third, we're going to collaborate with centers of excellence uh, and conduct events. Fourth, and this is playing into our wheelhouse, we're developing the tooling for conformance testing uh, of these applications and we'll be conducting regular evidence-based care uh, tracks within our testing events. Next slide. Uh, let's skip that and move right along. That's a summary of what I've gone over already. I, uh, I didn't make the five minutes, so I'm very sorry about that. Uh, as is true for every good Canadian, I will end with an apology and I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I think uh, we all and uh, the audience will excuse the extra two minutes, which were very useful to get a bit more insight on IHE and the work that you're carrying around the software as a medical device. Thank you very much. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I will now leave the floor to uh, Naoki Na uh, Nakashima from HL7, who will talk about the quality aspects uh, of apps um, uh, for uh, diabetes uh, patients and quality labeling, of course. Thank you, Naoki. Hello, this is Naoki from Japan. I'm uh, HS, uh, director of HS7 in Japan. Uh, today, I want to talk about the whole application quality, uh, not only technological standards, but also clinical standards are really important. So let me start. Next, next please. Several years ago, uh, six uh, academic, Japanese academic, academic society uh, led by the Association for Medical Informatics and also the Academy Secretariat of Japan uh, determined the, the two item sets, core item sets and cell management item sets uh, of uh, non-communicable disease, uh, as diabetes mellitus and hypertension, dyslipidemia and CKD, chronic kidney disease. And uh, basis on this uh, set item sets, uh, they also all decided recommended configuration for personal health record. Next, please. This is uh, the uh, minimum item sets for uh, non-communicable disease. Uh, 
the colored parts are the uh, core item set and the marked parts are the uh, self-management item sets. Uh, there are 41 item and we decided the uh, grand, uh, grand, uh, granularity and the expression. Next, please. And based on this 41 item sets, we also decided the recommended configuration for PHR. This is a sheet for the uh, healthier subject, no affected subject. And we decided risk classification threshold. I uh, don't read this one because it's too small. And, and alert threshold using fixed value and uh, alert threshold to prevent incorrect inputs. Next, please. And also we have the uh, option seat, the diabetic seat and hypertension dyslipidemia sheet and security sheet. Next, please. So we have 41 items and uh, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, minimum item sets in the left side. And also we decided the uh, remind period and also the color. This, is, this color is very similar to the, uh, e, uh, the, uh, the triage color, right? but this is a risk stratification color, right? The green, yellow, orange, red. Next, please. And also, uh, recently, Japanese government uh, start to uh, the uh, start to, to provide fund to support for digital health clinical guideline development to academic societies. So, these uh, the uh, field: diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, dementia, uh, sarcopenia, frail, mental health, women health. So uh, this is start just this year for three three years to uh, implement the digital health. Next, please. Of course, the uh, technological standardization is really important. Our recent Japanese government also promote HS fire implementation. Uh, based on this, uh, the uh, the bottom HS fire international HS by HS. Uh, international. This is uh, developed in two, 2019. Uh, we developed our fire team, national fire team, develop, developed JP Co-op version one just one year ago. And based on this JP Co-op and JP CC LIX, uh, we also decided the use case uh, standard, domestic standard. Uh, prescription and health checkup and patient administration summary and patient introduction letter uh, by the March this year. And we also uh, uh, developed the plan, concrete plan of the uh, infrastructure, network infrastructure using this. It's speed. This is one example. This is a uh, our POC is uh, the study. So right now we are conducting uh, the, uh, this kind of PHR POC using standard minimum item sets and also the smart on fire like this. So, oh, sorry, this is in Japanese, but uh, we use this item sets and a uh, fire in this application. Next, please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naoki, for uh, for the uh, very important and relevant insight into uh, uh, the Japanese uh, activities on uh, uh, health quality aspects on diabetes. Um, well, if there, I uh, remind again the audience that um, before starting a, pan, a round panel on uh, with uh, with everyone on on certain topics related to this uh, open forum, uh, if there are questions uh, uh, that we uh, would like to answer, please put them in the uh, question and answer. Um, uh, toolbox. Uh, now um, uh, we have a fifteen-minute moderated round. I would. I have a few questions uh, for uh, for all of you. 
um, I will I will start with uh, uh, the ladies first. So, uh, and the first question is uh, for Petra. We have talked a bit about uh, the uh, uh, EHDS, uh, which itself uh, foresees a regulatory sandbox where health data uh, data use can be tested and uh, regulatory measures can be developed. Uh, so, in theory, we don't have to wait for regulators, uh, but actually work in conjunction. Regarding the electronic uh, health uh, data space, uh, we have also been uh, in uh, talking with the European Commission about uh, uh, its regulation and how it actually can relate to quality labeling. Would you like to say something more on that? You're on mute. You're on mute, please. Um, uh, there's different stages in uh, in EHDS. There was a um, possibility to give feedback in July, which we did. Um, and we're now working towards uh, a bit more detailed um, input documents where we propose certain um, adjustments. Um, and I think that will likely be uh, finalized uh, this month. And then by the end of February, March, um, there's a next step in the uh, regulation. So we will use that time uh, in between to also connect with uh, members of the European Parliament and so forth. Okay. Thank you very much, Petra. Uh, getting to another question uh, for Serena Battilomo, we were uh, in her presentation, uh, it was evident that uh, there's, there are activities going on in Italy regarding uh, telehealth and the identification of quality criteria for telehealth system, and that the main inspirer actually uh, among other standards and other regulatory aspects has been uh, the technical specification. Um, so uh, it came that uh, there may be a need uh, to profile quality criteria and uh, quality labeling uh, at a national level, uh, not only for telehealth, but also for digital tools in, in general. Um, uh, would you like to uh, say something on, on a national profiling of these standards, uh, the need for this, Serena, please? Uh, sure. Uh, we are also working uh, not only to uh, spread and to use um, the telemedicine, but also for the use and for the upgrade of electronic uh, health record. And uh, so we are working on standards and we are meeting also the market and all the uh, providers just to implement uh, these uh, standards in the all clinical documents. Uh, and and there is also a, um, a great effort uh, also to upgrade from the CDA2 standard to the FIRE standard. Uh, that uh, is something not uh, so easy to implement. Uh, I saw uh, the presentation of uh, Mr. Nakashima uh, also in Japan, uh, they are working on it. Uh, and uh, But uh, in, in the health sector, maybe it's uh, the best uh, um, um, standard that, that can uh, provide uh, and uh, collect uh, all the information uh, in uh, a very good interoperable uh, way. So uh, we are working uh, progressive, uh, um, trying to standardize uh, all the kind of documents because uh, I think uh, in health we have to work uh, step by step. We have uh, many different information, so uh, each information has to be standardized and also upgraded uh, in, and also used. So uh, also in the European health data space, I think that uh, um, what we what, what is the lessons learned uh, um, all working all together in the last years is uh, that we have to fix uh, um, uh, our goals uh, step by step, uh, trying to move all together because otherwise we risk uh, that someone uh, uh, run uh, uh, up front, uh, but uh, some others uh, remain uh, um, in the back and this is not correct. Thank you very much, Serena. Thank you. Uh, Serena mentioned uh, FIRE, HL7 messages, 
uh, HL7 uh, uh, work and so on. So I would like to uh, ask um, uh, Frank Plegg about um, uh, the work, uh, the possible uh, harmonization uh, and work that we need to do uh, across not only the countries, but also across standardization bodies. So this is actually a question that anybody here could uh, could actually answer. But since uh, uh, we spoke about fire just now and uh, after Naoki's presentation, I think, uh, Frank, you can, you can actually talk about this uh, need for a cross standard uh, development organization uh, harmonization. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, of course, there is a need for uh, cross uh, standard uh, harmonization. I think uh, CMAF and, and technical specification A2304 2 is a good example of that. We have, um, I've got a huge mind map in my. Um, my library uh, trying to align uh, both standards uh, because uh, I think the biggest difficulty in that respect is the fact that we speak different languages, even if we speak the same language. So um, it's difficult to to relate one uh, technical specification item to a requirement within CMAP, but I think the need to um, to align and um, synchronize what we can is is uh, uh, evident <clears throat> thank you thank you very much uh, frank i now have a question for uh, naoki uh, uh, you made a, uh, an excellent presentation on uh, quality aspects for diabetes uh, was what we were wondering uh, do you think japan is planning to implement uh, the quality label uh, for for apps or to profile it for uh, japan uh, are there already plans for this in japan thank you uh, I mentioned about the Japanese government movement, but uh, just decided to, to provide the funding for, to, for the guideline. So, but I, I believe this is the just beginning of this kind of the quality labeling in the future, I think. But, you know, uh, the, somebody said the one word, one label. That is a very really great, great concept, I think. So it, maybe we have to communicate uh, with, uh, uh, with you and the United States also. And also we have to decide this kind of the quality labeling based on the clinical standard. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naoki. Uh, a question for, for Derek. In your presentation, uh, you mentioned that IHE is uh, downstream uh, from uh, uh, from the rest of the SDOs. Uh, do you think IHE is already looking into conformance testing of the quality label or uh, um, quality criteria in, in in its activities? I I hope so. I, I know that there was a discussion that was uh, already had on this topic. I mean, one of the strengths that IHE has, I think, is that uh, it tends to focus on a use case, uh, leverage a portfolio of specifications. I mean, there's there's never typically a standard from only one of the SDOs that is uh, part of a testable specification. Uh, I, I know that there are some things that can be quite objectively tested within the AD2304-2 specification, and I think that IHE's strength as a testing organization can play a role there. I also know that one of the things uh, for me personally that I think is an important addition is the addition of uh, uh, ethical pieces and the, some of the privacy pieces in, in Europe, the GDPR is very strong. So some of those are not as objectively testable um, or not uh, easily objectively tested. But I, I do think that there are certainly aspects of this that very much play to IHE strengths. And I know that IHE as an organization will wanna play a role in that. Great, thank you, Derek. Uh, before going to uh, some questions that are in the question and answer tool, I'd like to uh, pose a direct question to uh, Phil Archer, GS1, uh, regarding uh, GS1 and the uh, quality label. 
this question may also uh, have an impact on uh, Petra. Uh, when you mentioned uh, the uh, the GS1 activities, it uh, came to mind uh, the impact of uh, of uh, uh, some sort of uh, code or something on the label of uh, health quality apps. Would you be Would you please uh, build on this concept? Sure. Um, uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about today, I think any of us might have done, um, is a thing called a verifiable credential. We're working on that as part of our work. Um, and a verifiable credential is a technology that is really very applicable to the idea of quality labeling because it allows you to verify that the label is accurate or rather it hasn't been tampered with and it was issued by the person who says they issued it and you don't have to call home every time to look it up in a database. It uses cryptography and lots of technological doohickey. Um, but I think that ability to recognize a label and if there is a common ecosystem obviously standards based that allows you to look at not just one quality label but um if you have a common system that could look at multiple quality labels whether it's about the, the medical device you're looking at or whatever the particular clinical operation you're doing if you have some automatic automated reassurance that multiple people have followed multiple standards to say yes this is what these people say it is that gives you a lot of confidence that you've got the right thing and i think what we're talking about today with quality labels on the particular digital tools could be part of that ecosystem alongside other things and that common way of expressing quality labels in a way that can be cryptographically verified in milliseconds could be very helpful and if anyone's working on verifiable credentials in this space, please let me know because we we certainly are at GS1. Okay, thank you, thank you, Phil. I will try to condense uh, the, the the questions on uh, on the question and answer uh, forum uh, because uh, they regard um, a SEN ISO uh, specification one three one three one on telehealth services quality planning guidelines. Uh, this uh, this is a, a also a very important uh, standard on uh, uh, giving uh, implementation guidelines for telehealth services services in enterprises and um, uh, I will try to I will, I will um, try to condense the questions because uh, from 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 the question it is necessary to distinguish between tools applications and devices uh, and the service that they use um, in terms of telehealth services um, it is, uh, I, I think the questions uh, mainly regard uh, the relationship between uh, 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 13131 uh, about the telehealth services and um, uh, the uh, technical specification on the quality criteria. Uh, it, both of them uh, provide uh, information, provide reg, um, recommendations on quality. Uh, both of them, in one of the, uh, uh, in one way or another, uh, treat uh, telehealth services uh, uh, specifically one three one three one, while a uh, two three zero four uh, works upon uh, health ops for wellness. So I would like to ask uh, Petra and possibly other members of the panel to uh, build on the relationship uh, and the uh, 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 syn synergy between 13131 and 82304-2. Petra, would you like to start? Uh, well, 13131 uh, was actually referenced uh, within the framework uh, already. Um, and I, I think, uh, uh, Pierangelo, you can even uh, respond better than I can uh, in, in other respects with regard to uh, one free one free one. Well, I, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I, I can say actually that <laughs> from uh, from uh, from my point of view. Uh, there is uh, quite a lot of synergy between uh, the two standards, uh, in the sense that. Uh, there is a need for elementary quality criteria to bring together 
uh, all of the requirements uh, for digital health tools and uh, provide a framework for stakeholders uh, like the Italian Ministry of Health when they needed to identify quality criteria for uh, telehealth. Uh, which, by the way, uh, also references 13131 because it was brought into that uh, 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 working group. Uh, having said this, uh, on the other hand, uh, the scope of 13131 uh, is for identifying quality uh, guidelines for the implementation of telehealth services. So, <clears throat> so in in practice, 13131 actually uses. Uh, quality criteria and recommends quality criteria and guidelines for the implementation. So there, <clears throat> so from uh, from my opinion, there is ample margin for uh, integration and harmonization of the uh, two uh, standards. There is no uh, there is no uh, wish from uh, either side to. Um, in one way or another, overlap or duplicate the work. Uh, I think the work that needs to be carried out uh, is rather harmonization on uh, the quality criteria uh, that is needed on one side from for the from the stakeholders and for quality labeling of tools, and on the other side, uh, uh, it is need uh, the, the quality criteria is also needed to build upon. Uh, the well-defined uh, implementation guidelines uh, for telehealth services one three one through one. So, so in my opinion, there is ample margin for uh, harmonization of those two standards. No need to uh, overlap or duplicate work. <clears throat> okay, Derek, can you please build on top of that? I just wanted to point out generally that all of the specifications from the ISO 9000 family or any any from that group of, of uh, standards, they're process oriented. And uh, I do think, as you say, that there's something very complimentary about saying that any sort of process oriented specification uh, can be very helpful to an attribute based product oriented specification and the label really wants to say what would attributes uh, be around a particular product and so uh, the, the process aspects of all of that iso 9000 family i think are very helpful it, uh, but they're a bit upstream of what would then be on a label which are attributes that can be associated with a particular product and just as an as a kind of top level editorial comment <laughs> okay Great, thank you, Derek. <clears throat> one, one more thing, uh, since we're talking about uh, telehealth uh, um, and services, uh, we should also mention that uh, EHDS also uh, states that countries that accept telehealth services should also be able to accept cross-border telehealth services. So once again, uh, uh, telehealth uh, quality criteria, quality implementation of uh, uh, telehealth services uh, inside healthcare organizations are uh, quite uh, quite fundamental here. And again, uh, the need for harmonization of uh, the quality criteria used uh, within uh, uh, on one side one three one through one, and the need to uh, not duplicate uh, the efforts. Um, Having uh, said uh, this, um, I would just like to pose a general question to uh, to the panelists, uh, asking for one or more of you to answer. Uh, we we talked about uh, health apps, uh, quality criteria for health and wellness apps. Uh, we've talked about the activities going on in in the. Uh, different uh, uh, standardization bodies. We've talked about its relation to different uh, standards like uh, 13131. Uh, now, uh, I personally see the need for extending uh, the standards that relate to quality criteria also uh, beyond uh, the world of uh, health and wellness apps. And uh, I, think, I think we are saying this uh, in compassing, uh, and actually Derek stated this when talking about software as a medical device in general. Um, uh, there, there is a growing need to extend uh, quality criteria and quality also to other 
uh, let's call them topics, uh, for example, digital therapies, uh, for example, uh, digital uh, health uh, devices, and so on. Uh, I know that, for example, in HL7, uh, there are um, quite a few uh, requirements. Uh, and one of these is actually covered in the project I talked about in my presentation, Expand DH, about the European uh, the EHR. Uh, exchange format. So there is quite a few things to say. I see that Serena Batiloma has her hand up, so I will uh, uh, ask her to continue to state. Thank you. Thank you, Pierangelo. Just uh, to um, talk about the question and answer about uh, uh, 13131 and the uh, European Health Data Space uh, uh, draft uh, regulation. Uh, okay, there is an in the Article 8 uh, um, uh, states that the countries uh, that accept uh, telehealth services should also accept cross border tele telehealth services. But this is a, a proposal. We are working on the uh, on this point because uh, uh, cross border telehealth is uh, something that uh, we are still uh, uh, regulating. Uh, since uh, um, there is also um, um, an aspect of reimbursement uh, and uh, about uh, uh, the the, the uh, assistance, uh, cross border assistance. Uh, so it's not so easy. It's not only a problem of standards, but also regulate uh, the uh, reimbursement of this uh, uh, assistant. Uh, but surely um, all these standards uh, and regulation uh, like 13131 can help us uh, uh, for. Uh, assessment for the quality assessment of uh, the solution that we can recognize also for telehealth. I think that uh, also the standard is uh, a work uh, in which uh, we can proceed uh, step by step Step, so with the continuous improvement. So uh, what we fixed uh, uh, before uh, can uh, use the, and also announced uh, in the new standard and in, in the new uh, complete vision uh, uh, that considers uh, other aspects, uh, not only uh, that one, uh, the main one that, that uh, you have considered stand, standardizing at the beginning on the quality. Um, we have uh, every day, uh, uh, an, an opportunity to learn the, uh, to consider more aspects. And that's the point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Um, is there anyone else that wants to build up on this? Otherwise, I will um, I will uh, restate the, the I think what could be the last question of this uh, uh, panel. Um, how how do you see the extension of quality criteria also to uh, uh, Derek already talked about software as a medical device, but also to uh, the to cover the scope and uh, Serena talked about uh, using quality criteria uh, in Italy for for telehealth uh, systems uh, to go uh, beyond and extend uh, this technical specification or quality criteria and quality labeling also beyond uh, health apps. Is there anybody that would like to uh, talk about this? The reason I ask is that uh, in uh, the project Expand DH, as I stated, there is a uh, a uh, task on uh, quality labeling of consumer health devices. Uh, so uh, it is obvious that it will also build on standards like 82304-2 uh, as an inspiration, uh, possibly providing feedback to 82304-2 itself. And also, of course, uh, uh, taking quality aspects from other standards. Um, I see Derek's hand up. So Derek, please. Uh, sure. I, I think that there's a very interesting um, aspect in digital health that's, uh, that's gaining a bit, of, uh, a bit of energy right now. WHO has got a project underway that they refer to as smart guidelines. Uh, WHO is a normative organization, publishes about 50 care guidelines. So, uh, you know, immunization schedules for children and antenatal care and so on and so on. Uh, they've got about five of those now that have been uh, the narrative 
care guideline has been translated into a computable format so that it can be ingested by and understood by an electronic medical records uh, solution. And I think that that's creating an interesting, um, maybe, maybe a labeling challenge. Uh, we, we will want to be able to say that uh, any particular representation of a narrative care guideline can be verified that it's a good one and that uh, any solution that's executing that computable care guideline would faithfully execute that com computable care guideline. There's all sorts of safety aspects to that. I, I personally feel that any solution that's working that way is going to immediately find itself in the regulate, uh, regulated space um, of software as a medical device. But it certainly has got a, a a requirement that these artifacts themselves would have to be trusted artifacts and that any digital health solutions making use of those would have to be uh, trusted uh, trusted solutions. Uh, I sense that this is uh, a direction that, that digital health writ large is going to be going. And uh, it speaks to the heart of some of this important standards development work, uh, because if ever we lost the public's trust uh, our ability to go forward with some of the benefits that we hope to get from from these kinds of large initiatives would would be undermined. Okay, thank you, Derek. I also see Phil uh, Phil Archer from GS One has uh, something to add to this. Please, please just go to, ahead, Phil. Thank you. Just to build a little bit on what Derek was just saying. Um, uh, yes, the the these digital health apps they work in an ecosystem um and um the borderline between clinical health stuff uh and consumer health products and so on um of course there are blurred lines there um what gs1 is about what we're trying very hard to do is to make it easy to link a physical thing i suppose it could even be a virtual thing to those certifications to those quality labels and again i come back to the fact that if those labels um please please i hope they're machine readable i hope it isn't just a pdf or something right you've got some data that a machine can consume and can verify and then so i think that the app should um make use of every bit of information available about the um the 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 pharmaceutical or medical device or the procedure that they can um and if they can verify that stuff they verify that information then it is the job of that app to provide reassurance to patients and clinicians and we can make that happen as long as the certifications the quality labels something i've worked on in different ways for more years than i care to count um as long as they're machine readable and we can now make them verifiable in a cryptographic way and i think that's something that uh will help this particular ecosystem of apps we're certainly using in other areas um my work covers the whole of gs1's stuff so it's you know, construction and, and rail and obviously retail um but it's the same system wherever you look Okay, thank you very much, Phil. You, you uh, among the many things, uh, important things you said is uh, again uh, that uh, all of this work on quality criteria. And with this, I go back to the first presentation by Serena Batilomo. Uh, our work is uh, mainly uh, in the direction of uh, creating trust in the users, uh, giving support to uh, industry, to the decision makers. I think uh, with sound quality criteria uh, in uh, digital health tools, we are on the right track, bring, bringing together in that quality criteria all of the requirements that are actually needed uh, by the decision makers to put things into practice and for the users to recognize and the consumers and the industry to actually uh, get things going. So um, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, the whole group here, the panel for uh, a very, very interesting uh, um, discussion. I will give the floor back to uh, Andreas, and I would also like to thank uh, the audience for the uh, questions, <coughs> questions uh, and the answers, and uh, looking forward to harmonization and working together with also members of the audience. Thank you very much, Andreas, uh, our uh, chairman of the JIC. Please uh, take the floor for the conclusions now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pia and Angelo. And yeah, this concludes uh, today's uh, open forum, the first session of today's open open forum. Uh, to summarize, uh, we heard in, in this session from Zorina um, Batilomo that and why quality labeling of uh, digital tools is so important. 
and that organizations like the European Commission, COSI, and of course Italy are already started uh, have already started to refer uh, to SEM IEC ISO uh, uh, 82304 2 for this. Additionally, there is the declared need to strengthen the European leadership in, in global standards. So to meet that need uh, in the area of quality tools in mHealth, a uh, SEM project was started where ISO, IEC, and HL7 joined in, demonstrating the global need for such quality criteria and making this a cool two cross uh, SDO collaboration. And that's an activity all GIC members can really be proud of. This uh, then eventually led uh, to part uh, two to supplement the existing part one of 82304, which is on safety and security of health software in, in general. We got inside how 82304-2 helps to select good health um, apps via a label, which has some similarity to the well-known energy efficiency label for, for appliances. In the panel, we heard how HL7 contributed to this to the consumer mobile health application functional framework, and that in overall the goal is one world, one label. From the other, other panelists, we heard how implementing standards like the standards being developed by the members of the GIC are an efficient way to improve the quality of digital tools in, in general. With the quality collaborative work um, of the SDOs, the path has been laid throughout for more transparency and quality in digital tools, even if there's still more room for further harmonization. Now it's important to follow this path thereby carefully considering to build and maintain trust in such labels. I'd like to thank all speakers and the organizing team for today's Joint Initiative Council Open Forum. Thanks to all attendees for having joined us. Uh, to stay informed about the Open Forum, again, the reminder, follow us on uh, Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Please also check out the GIC website uh, where recordings of the open forum uh, sessions from today will be published and where also past open forum recordings are available. I wish you a pleasant rest of your day, wherever you are. Looking forward to virtually meeting you again in a future open forum. Thank you. Bye bye.